hint of Christmas. Christmas is a big subject, but we're going to do a magic trick, which I've incredibly tenuously linked to Christmas. We're going to look at robins. Are they that great? I don't know. We're going to look at chocolate and raisins, Christmas cake, and see which one you should be eating. Um, we're going to have a quick look at what is happening inside a Christmas cracker snapper. We're going to smell some cinnamon and talk about why we're not very good at that. And story time! Quite a big story time at the end today. I have practised it because I, it took me a while to be able to do it without crying. But different subjects. Okay, now, normally at this time of year, people who worked in offices would be getting together for the famous Christmas celebration, the office Christmas party, when people get to spend time with the people that they work with uh, in a very small environment and at an office Christmas party. It's traditional for people to gather, hang out and chat to each other around the photocopier. Now photocopiers work using static electricity. So I thought, what better activity to celebrate Christmas than a static electricity <laughs> exercise? See, perfect, isn't it? Do you like how, what I did there? So we've done a lot of static electricity um, like activities before, but we haven't done this one. It's the coolest activity that I have not yet shown you. All you need is a plastic bag and a drinks can. Okay, start with a plastic bag. Regulars, you've, you've heard about static electricity before. You know what I'm going to say. Get your plastic bag, rub it on your head, all right? Now, if you've been coming to my home editing lessons that I do Tuesdays at half past one, you should be able to tell me exactly what is happening here. <coughs> Everything in the world is made of atoms. They look a little bit like this. If you could stare with incredible vision into any object, your teeth, the air, a packet of Pringles, you would see that everything is made of atoms. They're little positively charged and neutral balls with negative balls whizzing around them, okay? Protons, positive, in the middle, negative electrons whizzing around the outside. And there's different kinds of atoms, but they're basically all like this. Um, positive and negative charge, what does that mean? Well, things that are negative push away from each other. So two electrons repel, they want to be away from each other. Um, positive and negative things attract. So a proton and electron, positive and negative, they would come towards each other if they had the chance. Okay, so amazingly, even though atoms are just the incredibly most teeny tiny things ever, when you're rubbing a plastic bag on your head, Oh, look at this. Yes, Abby. Electrons are going in my hair, making it negatively charged. And the bag positively charged. Well done. You even remembered the right way around. Yeah. The, <laughs> the atoms in this plastic bag, the electrons around the outside of them, the red ones, are coming off. You're rubbing electrons off the atoms in the plastic bag and you're putting them onto your hair. I'm going to regret sellotaping my hair in a minute, aren't I? And you'll notice that now you've got a bit less negative charge on your plastic bag. So we, we could say that it's positively charged overall. It's got fewer electrons on it, so it's more positively charged. And your hair is negatively charged. So when you put them together again, how carefully we are listening, you can see. Yeah, there you go. They get attracted to each other. All right, so that's, that's fairly straightforward. Here's the weird trick, okay? If you get a drinks can, you see that see how hard I had to work last night for you guys put it on the table put it on a, a flat surface rub the bag on your head and then move it near the drinks can see what happens I should show you shouldn't I come here because maybe you're not doing this at home some people didn't have a drinks can you can try it later so watch this you ready very clearly I am not moving the can am I? I mean admittedly it's, <laughs> it's been more impressive than that but still you can make a can move without touching it how good's that what is happening there this is this is actually oh there we go that's better isn't it look what now <clears throat> if you've done better than this if you've got yours like properly rolling along then I want to know but still that is some Harry Potter stuff now we haven't rubbed the can have we so what's going on there how is the can being that attracted to the bag? Well, I'll show you. Mm, press, flip, press, flip. <laughs> sort of 
regretting doing, doing that one first. Um, inside the can, the atoms look a little bit different. The protons are fixed in place, vibrating gently, but the electrons are all free to like whiz around. So when you put your positively charged plastic bag next to the can, all the electrons are attracted to it. So it creates, you know, a bit of a force, a bit of a moving force, and it moves the can. Let's just say by magic. Very cool. All right, so that's static electricity. Um, let's quickly look at raisins and chocolate. So you're going to have a lot of choices this Christmas for, um, for what kind of sugary things you want to eat. This is 100 grams of raisins, and this is uh, slightly less than 100 grams of chocolate. But, you know, what, what are you going to do? It's my show. I get to eat the chocolate if I want. This is 200, so half of this is the same as... A, one of these 100 grams okay um i mean obviously usually you're gonna eat the raisins in like christmas cake aren't you or mince pies but we'll we'll say raisins for now to keep it easy which one is better for you which ones because i'd heard right that lots of people think that because raisins are fruit they're just dried grapes they're one of your five a day that people think that raisins are really good for you but then i heard that actually they've got loads and loads of sugar in them and they're not that good for your teeth and you shouldn't eat that many so i was like well maybe it's it maybe chocolate's actually better for you. Let's see. So I made this incredibly stylish. I think you'll agree. Chart. So we've got raisins, chocolate, and then the nutrients down the side. Okay. We'll just look for now at fat, sugar, fibre, protein, and salt. Which ones have got more in? Okay. If I see that, I've noticed a funny phenomenon. If I get loads of angry faces, I always think, oh, some two-year-old's got hold of the screen. Never mind. But if I get loads of laughing faces, I'm like. <laughs> They think they're funny. <laughs> Just a good tip for life there. Um, right, you ready? Then fat. Well, probably won't be that surprising to you that chocolate's got a lot of fat in it. This is per 100 grams. So a third of this is just fat. But raisins don't have any fat in. Sugar? Well, yeah. Okay. That's, that's quite bad news, isn't it? Raisins have got even more sugar than chocolate. And chocolate's pretty much... Chocolate's over half sugar. Raisins are two-thirds sugar. Fibre... Well, not surprisingly, raisins have got a bit of fibre in because they're fruit, but actually, chocolate has got some fibre in too. Ah, uh, yeah, see, Nor was getting it right. Yeah, the raisins have more sugar. Protein? Check this out. Look, there's more protein in chocolate. I'm saying this like you all want to eat chocolate. Maybe you really like raisins. And salt, which obviously we can't eat too much of. Um, there's a bit more salt in chocolate. But that's not too bad, right? I mean, chocolate... All the, choc all the fat in chocolate is saturated as well. Yeah, and then it's not, it's not quite the full story because then I sort of found this as well. I'm like, oh, this is, yeah, so this is the full story that manganese, phosphorus, vitamin B6, iron, all very good for you, very important. 14% um, of your daily need comes from raisins. And potassium, they've got over, there's over twice what's in a banana. Although obviously bear in mind, bananas are a lot heavier than raisins. Like, I mean, pro to be honest, I could probably eat 100 grams of raisins quite easily. Um, in a Christmas cake but hopefully you're a little bit more self-controlled um, have a look at the ingredients raisins are generally just dried in the sun so the ingredients of raisins are usually just raisins the golden ones they're dried by machine so they've got something else in them uh, sulfur dioxide to preserve them the ingredients of milk chocolate dairy milk it's got palm palm oil in it which is a bit annoying it's got some E numbers in it I thought we'd talk about those very briefly. It's got E442 in it. E442 lowers surface tension. So you know how oil floats on top of water, they don't mix together. E442 makes oil and water mix together, so it stops different parts of the chocolate separating and keep, help, holds them all together. So, you know, you think of E numbers as being evil, that's quite useful, isn't it? And the other E number it's got is E4. 76 um which makes the chocolate a little bit thinner so that it flows better which means that they can put less cocoa butter in it which is more expensive so that e number e476 it's not great it's just they can use it so they don't have to put the sort of nicer more expensive ingredient in so yeah and also um this little symbol here is quite interesting because a lot of people would think that that means that this packet is recyclable it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that. It means that Cadbury's have given some money to sort of good causes that do recycling. But actually, this packet, not recyclable. My raisin packet, which I got from the, you know, Good Food, Awesome, York 
hippie shop, I think we'd agree, uh, it's compostable, so that's good. So there you go, I don't know, make, make your own minds up, but pro probably better opt for the Christmas cake if you've got one. Right, let's do a little cinnamon sniff, and then I want to rant at you about Robins, okay? So, little activity, if you've got any kind of spice with you, get it ready, but don't touch it yet. First of all, get your drinks can, all right? Look at the drinks can and take 10 seconds and just describe the drinks can as well as you can. Imagine that someone can't see the drinks can, right? Bear with me, this is going somewhere. Imagine that someone can't see the drinks can and they don't know what a drinks can is. Describe it to them, okay? Just use as many words as you can, as many descriptive words as you can. So I could say um, it's yellow, it's shiny, I could say it looks like it's made of metal, I could say um, it's a cylinder, I could say it's got a little piece of metal on the top that when you press it, it opens, I could say it's got black writing on it and a white barcode, I could say it looks like it might make a little dinging noise when I touch it, um, I could say it looks like it would feel cold, you, you'd probably find that it's quite easy to describe the drink scan in a lot of different ways. Right, now get your cinnamon, okay? and give it a smell and do the same thing with the cinnamon, all right? Describe the cinnamon to someone who has never smelt cinnamon before, doesn't know what it is. <laughs> See, I hadn't practiced this because I wanted to... It smells like Christmas. It smells like wood. I don't know, give me some ideas. Uh, answers coming in about the drinks can. Yeah, good. It's not a shiny metal cylinder. All right. Martha's can smell cinnamon, even though she's in Cornwall and she doesn't have any. Blimey. What do you reckon? Oh, Joanna's saying chocolate wrapper can be recycled through Terra Cycle Scheme. I didn't read that about dairy milks. About some of them, yeah. I'll look into that, Joanna. I read definitely that they couldn't be. Anyway. Yeah, Caitlin's saying smells like Christmas. Lucy Marlowe is saying it's very hard to describe, it is, and this is an actual thing, okay? People in the West, we don't tend to be very good at describing smells. So there's someone, a scientist called a, a psycholinguist, which is a brilliant name, a sort of psychologist um, that studies like psychology and languages. They studied a group of people called the Jihai people who live in Malaysia and they live in forests and they did this test where they gave the Jahai people 12 different like scratch and sniffs um, to do. Some with smells that they'd never actually smelled before and they could describe them in loads of different ways and they were saying things like, um, it, they sort of said obviously in their own language that it said like it has a stinging smell if it was like smoke or back droppings or it smelled roasted or or even like it, oh it has a bloody smell that attracts tigers if it was like the smell of meat or something um but when they did that with english speakers the english speakers would just say things like uh smells like a banana <laughs> smells like soap or would say stuff like oh it's stinky <laughs> um and the 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 psycholinguist says i just thought this was a lovely quote if people displayed similar performance with a visual object, they would be sent for medical help. <laughs> but the point of this test, well, I mean, it, there were loads of great points, but one of the things this linguist is saying is that be really careful in science that you don't only, only study one group of people. Because if you only studied English speakers, you would think, oh, humans, terrible at naming smells. Whereas actually... It's just that in our society, everything's very clean. Like we wear deodorant, we use a lot of shampoo. We tend to take a lot of our natural smells around us away. Whereas the Jahai people live in the forests, hunter gatherers. It's really important for them to be able to smell things really well because you know if if they can if they can smell something that smells like it's going to attract a tiger, obviously you need to know that. Or if something smells delicious, or you know. Um, so yeah, I thought that was a really interesting point, that if you only study English speakers, you might not know what human beings are totally capable of. So yeah, you go away and practice your smelling today. Right, it's time for the controversial bit. <clears throat> I'm going to flash my one-eyed Robin at you. Yeah, so I have suggested on Facebook that maybe Robins do not deserve their Christmas bird status, and people got a bit upset with me, okay? So I asked you... Why are robins associated with Christmas? Is it because they're more active? Is it because they're very kind to each other? Do they help the poor? Do they have red on them? Now, um, the, the original story apparently for why robins are Christmassy 
is that there's a story that when uh, Mary was in the stable, the little baby Jesus, Jesus, they lit a fire and it was going to go out. Baby Jesus was going to get cold and the little brown bird flew in and started flapping its wings against the fire to get more air to the fire to make it burn more brightly. Very good idea, bird, getting oxygen to the flame, make the flame, flame burn brighter. So far, so good. Um, but the bird singed itself, like got a bit of a burn, a red burn. And from then on, the robin has always had a red breast. Um, now, that is a beautiful story and not how evolution works. So if a giraffe is born with a slightly longer neck and it can reach higher leaves, then it's more likely to have babies. And those babies will have that trait of a longer neck and they survive and it gets passed on. If you burn yourself, you're not going to pass that. It's not a genetic thing. It's not in your makeup of your body. There's no your babies that you have. They're not going to have a burn. So... It's a great story, it's not very scientific. The other one is, I didn't know this, that Christmas cards were invented in Victorian times and Victorian postmen used to wear red, um, so they were called robins. So Christmas cards tended to have a picture of a robin delivering a Christmas card because the postmen were called robins. So that's how robins became associated with Christmas. But because they've got red on them, there are other birds with red on them, okay? Now, are they, are they more active at Christmas? No, they're not. But you do see more of them because in the winter time, um, robins from Europe, where it's very cold, they fly to England for the food and the slightly warmer weather. So they're not more active at Christmas, but you do see more robins at Christmas. Yes, fair enough. Um, they j just last year, they managed to tag a robin. So, you know, they tag anim animals to find out like where they go and how they behave. I didn't realise this. It's illegal to tag a, an animal with a tag that weighs more than three percent of its weight you can't tag a bird with a tag that weighs more than three percent of the bird because it's just not kind for the bird but they finally invented a little nano tag that they could put on this robin that weighs 19 grams and it flew across the north sea like they watched it fly all the way from germany all the way over the north sea all the way to england in um how long is it well it, it went 140 miles um, in four hours, which is, oh no, it went over the North Sea in four hours. Anyway, average speed of 35 miles per hour, which for an animal which weighs 19 grams, yeah, fair enough, that's pretty good. It's one of the only birds that sings all the way through winter. But why does it sing? It sings because it's incredibly territorial. So birds, little robins in winter, they've got a patch which is about 50 metres by 50 metres and they guard it doing extreme lengths right like scientists have put little stuffed robins on a robin's patch and watched as a robin just like repeatedly attacks it sometimes if it's just some little red feathers a robin's just like no what are you doing here get off this is my patch so if you hear a robin singing a beautiful song in winter it's actually going go away go away go away go away my spot my spot my spot my spot not not that nice um so that's the whole purpose of the red breast as well by the way it's not to like look really good to attract another robin it's just to be like i am here get away other robins so i have found some birds which i thought might be a better candidate for our christmas bird okay i've got three here we go um should say i'm, bre I'm breaking the law i haven't got a color printer so i am using images from this book by matt sewell i have not got the so if you buy this book because you think it looks lovely can you message me and tell me so that when i'm getting done for copyright i can explain that it was a good thing right here is the little brambling okay what a sweetie it's got red on it okay and um bramblings migrate to the uk from winter so you see more bramblings at christmas time um and kind of looks like batman yeah it's like a robin but it's more friendly and it looks like batman it forms mixed flocks so it joins up with other tiny little birds to like flock around in the sky i mean how cute is that it's sociable it's got red on it and it looks like batman here we have the red wing. I mean, come on. The red wing also has red in it. Um, it travels at night to find things to eat, like Santa Claus. Yeah. Um, and it eats holly. Look, I mean, how Christmas is that? Eats holly, travels at night, and it's got red on it. Right, and the last candidate is um, the, the cold tip. Okay, fair enough, cold tips don't have any red on them, but they're so cute. And they live in Christmas trees and they, if you, I've noticed a cold tip just going at our bird feeder for ages and ages. I was like, how? It's so small. It turns out they steal food from bird feeders and they hide it to get later. So it lives in Christmas trees and it's like a mashup between a bird and a squirrel. I mean, come on. So those are your options. The cold tip or the red wing. 
which sneaks around at night just like Santa Claus and eats holly, or the brambling, which looks like Batman. Or you can have a Robin. What, what are you going to do? There's a 15 second delay on the comments, so I want you to tell me what you're going to go for. Tiny little brambling. They've all got red on them, but the brambling um, forms little mixed blocks with all its little birdie friends. Looks like Batman's still got red on it and there's more around at winter. Red wings sneak around at night, have red on them, eat holly. Uh, Cold tits, cost between a bird and a squirrel. Hang out in Christmas trees. Now, I had preformed ideas about robins. I had decided that robins were like really aggressive and brutal and I didn't like them. And then I did more research. Okay, cool. So Marlo says Coltit, Joanne says Red Wing. <laughs> Anna, 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 who's just a troublemaker and I'm going to block, says Penguin. Coco says, I want that book. Thanks, Coco. That's good. Um, people saying Red Wing. All right, we're voting for the Red Wings. I didn't. Okay, oh, nice. I'm going to count these up afterwards. Nor wants a Bramling. People are generally going for the Red Wings because it's like the Father Christmas of the bird world. Yeah, I did find out really quite recently that Robins are really good parents, okay? Robins get together to raise their young until they're ready to leave the nest. And they're such good parents that if there's another bird um, in a nest, another little chick in a nest, like a blackbird chick or something that needs some food, the robins go and give the other birds food. So, if, so you might see a robin feeding chicks, but it might not even be that robin's chicks. And I left that to the end because I thought that's definitely going to persuade them. So actually, how stupid is it? But this, um, this they help the poor. To me, that is actually, that is kind of true. And pretty good reason for robins to be associated with Christmas. But I'm loving that everyone's voting for the red wing. I think I'm going to make this a thing. I need to create, we need to create a red wing meme. Okay, yeah, all right. Eli likes the robin because he hangs out with us when we're gardening. So Eli, exactly. This is the thing with robins. Robins, horrible to each other. Really, really nice to everybody else. Love, love hanging out with humans. Love hanging out with, with um, other birds, apparently. Okay, we've only got one last thing to do. I'm um, Very quickly, awesome fact about this cracker snap that I didn't know. Um, why do crackers snap? Well, one side of them is coated in sandpaper. And the other side of them is coated in this chemical that I'd never heard of called silver fulminate. Awesome fact about silver fulminate is it is incredibly explosive and unstable. Um, it's made of four, four different atoms, chemistry fans would like to know. It's got a silver atom, a carbon atom, a nitrogen atom and an oxygen atom. But the bond between the nitrogen and the oxygen is really, really weak. So if you, if you like knock it too much, or warm it up, it just explodes. Like to the point where it's only useful for use in crackers because silver fulminate is so unstable that if you get too much of it, just the weight of the particles of silver fulminate will make it explode. It's so, so literally you can only have it in teeny tiny amounts, which is why it works for crackers. I'm gonna bang this one, okay? This is my first cracker of the year. Oh, so loud. If you saw my ear lesson, you know that I've got tinnitus. That was a bad idea. But let's look inside. So there you go. There's the the little black. I guess that's some. Um, yeah, that must be the silver fulminate. Look, it's got all charred there. Ah. Mm, smells great. And mm, where's the sandpaper? Oh, I wonder if the sandpaper is. I think that must be the sandpaper as well. It does feel very rough. If you've got any crackers this year, then inspect them. But yeah, I thought. Um, that was quite cool, but something I have not been able to find out. This is the only thing during any of these shows since March that I've looked up and I can't find the answer. How do they make Christmas crackers? If you can't get more than a tiny little bit of silver fulminate at any one time, how do they do this? They can't be dipping it in a vat of silver fulminate. Like it's, it's a single person. You can't even make very much of it at the same time because it would just... Is a person making tiny amounts and then dabbing it on? But that'll take ages. Like, we don't make stuff like that anymore, do we? I don't know. If you find out how crackers are made, tell me. I want to know. Right. It's story time. Are you ready? Today's story time is about peace on earth um, and advertising and Christmas trees. Now, in order to do a story time about peace on earth, I, I, I am having to talk about war a little bit at the beginning. But, um, but bear with me, okay? It, it does get happy in the end. Right, here we go. It's a bit, it's, um, a bit of an elaborate setup today. Just bring 
you in? <laughs> Colombia, beautiful country next to Brazil in South America. It's got incredible plants. It's got flowing water. There we go. It's got gorgeous animals. Seriously, they do actually have pink dolphins in Colombia. It's got everything it needs to be a perfect place. Um, and it also has the oldest gorilla in the world. Not the fun... Oh, oops. Press, splash, press. Uh, not the fun kind of gorilla, I'm afraid. Um, a gorilla, spelt like this, is uh, people in a country who are fighting a war who aren't the official military, like they're not the police or the army, they're civilians, although sometimes they're very, very well-trained civilians. Um, in Colombia, the gorilla, gorilla usually live in the mountains um, or the jungles because the military, the police, etc., they don't know the local area as well as the locals do. So the locals have got an advantage and um, gorillas usually fight by ambushing or raiding. For example, in the early 1800s, um, Spanish and Portuguese people actually used guerrilla warfare and managed to defeat Napoleon, even though Napoleon's army was much better. And the word guerrilla actually comes from this time. Uh, guerrilla means little war in Spanish. So some guerrillas are fighting for their human rights and some of them um, use fear and violence. If you go to Colombia, the UK government does say to avoid certain places because guerrilla groups can attack without warning and kidnappings are sadly very common. Uh, Yuli Valesco, whose name is impossible to not say in a Spanish accent, she supports women who have been affected by Colombia's guerrilla war. Um, she tried to take the soldiers to court, but in the end they sent her so many scary text messages and letters that she actually had to leave her village. But she says, um, if we stay silent, this country will get worse. So she's actually still doing what she does, but from a different place. So for 52 years, um, the main guerrilla group in Colombia called the FARC have uh, led this war, or did lead this war in Colombia. Um, kidnapping, uh, doing illegal mining, just generally horrendous, um, terrorising of, of people who really had done nothing wrong at all. In 2014, someone called Jose Miguel Sokolov got a chance to help. So the government came to his group and they said, right, we've been working on strategies to bring peace to Colombia. And they said, we've got the legal side sorted. Uh, that's supposed to be a judge. If anyone has any Lego after Christmas that they're selling, you, you guys let me know. Um, they've got the legal side sorted, they've got the political side sorted, and they had the legal side sorted, but they didn't have the communication side sorted. So, Jose's group talked to 60 ex guerrillas and what they found out was that actually, they weren't all evil bad guys. Jose says, it turns out that a lot of these guerrillas, they were prisoners of their organisation, and he was amazed and touched by their stories. So one girl had been recruited by the guerrillas when she was 15, and while she was there, she'd met a boy who'd been recruited when he was 17, and they'd fallen madly in love. But love is not allowed in the lower ranks of the guerrillas. So when the bosses had discovered them, they'd split them up and they'd sent the boy really far away. And one night, when the girl was on guard, she says, she just put down her weapon and she started walking. And she managed to escape. And Jose and his group, they were so touched by her interview that they put it on the radio. And the radio waves travelled many, many, many kilometres to the north where the boy who'd been sent far away 
heard his lost love's voice. And he thought, what am I doing here? She had the courage to get out. I need to as well. So he started walking. He actually walked for two days and two nights all the time, knowing that the gorillas would have noticed that he'd gone. He thought only of the girl. And eventually, um, the, the gorilla bosses didn't catch him. And he did, in fact, meet up with the girl, all thanks to this radio interview. Um, there we go. So, yeah, this girl and the boy who'd been split up, they lived. Um, well, Jose didn't stay in touch with them, actually, so we, we don't know. But this is the real life story, okay? This, this is what you get. It's not gonna be perfect. So that method, that worked quite well. That brought quite a lot of gorillas home. Um, but to bring peace to the, to the country, they needed more gorillas to stop. Then someone in their team, in Jose's team, did a brilliant thing. Okay, they realised that if you look at the amount of people leaving the gorillas, there's a huge spike at Christmas time. People miss their families at Christmas and they got the courage they needed to escape. So Jose came up with a plan. A high ranking gorilla gave them a helicopter and some of the things that they needed because he said, isn't this beautiful, um, being generous makes me stronger. And this is what they did. They, they used these enormous helicopters to find the main jungle paths and um, through the pathways in the jungle they put gigantic Christmas trees covered with Christmas lights and next to each one was a sign which read if Christmas can come to the jungle you can come home at Christmas anything is possible 331 gorillas came home but those gorillas told Jose and his team that actually gorillas now mainly use the rivers in Colombia for traveling. They don't really use the paths anymore. So then his team collected uh, Christmas presents and messages, some from the mothers of the gorillas. And what they did was they put them um, at a safe place on the river and they let the river carry them along to where the gorilla were. And while they were doing that, um, one gorilla came home every six hours. And then, and this, this is the bit where I, you know, someone's chopping onions near me, so sorry if you hear sniveling in the background. Uh, then they suddenly thought, oh, maybe um, the gorillas are worried about coming home because they think that everyone in Colombia is going to be judging them. So what they did was they ran a massive advertising campaign where soldiers and footballers and celebrities were featured sitting next to empty seats and said we're saving a seat for you it was the world cup so everyone was getting really excited because Colombia were doing really well in the world cup so they used this to say hey gorillas if you want to stop fighting come home we're all waiting for you um but over eight years because of Jose's team and many 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 others over 17,000 gorillas came home in 2016, a uh, new president, Juan Manuel Santos, managed to get the FARC, sorry, just doing a little head change, uh, managed to get the FARC to sign a peace deal. One of the oldest guerrilla armies in the world joined politics. Uh, Santos was awarded a Nobel Peace Prize and almost overnight the war was over. And that is the story of how advertising, with a little help from science, maths, very good communication, uh, big ideas and careful thinking, brought about peace for a bit. Anyway, <laughs> real stories are always more complicated. The end. Uh, yes, if you're interested and you, you look up the situation in Colombia now, you will, you will find that uh, things sort of progressed quite quickly in not terribly positive ways but it was a real real positive moment that we're going to finish on because it's Christmas <sighs> right everybody uh, that is the end of my science of Christmas show thank you so much for joining me that was so fun the specials are definitely the best this wasn't even my idea this was just us chatting at the end of a different show and someone said you should do the science of Christmas and I was like yeah good idea um there's lots of new people here so I'm, go I'm gonna do my little advert and then I'll chat, okay? Um, so, yes, I started doing this, 
I've been doing this since March, like one a week over lockdown, but it's kind of turned into a job because some wonderful people are actually paying me to do this. Um, if you go to my Facebook page, then just above the like button, it says buy now, shop here, shop now or something. And it takes you to this website called Patreon that I'm on. Um, it's, it's sort of for podcasts and things like that, where you can support people with like three or five or ten pounds a month. Um, and there's different thank yous for doing it. So anyone who signs up with anything gets these rainbow glasses that I've got. That let you see rainbows or if you sign up with five pounds a month then you get this uh, bi-monthly magazine that i do my husband is a graphic designer so i am milking that for all it's worth um it's got like totally new scientific content but it's sort of designed to be like a magazine to mirror the show so it's kind of for adults as well sort of six years up i learn a lot when i'm writing it it's got like puzzles and quite heavy science in it but also like yeah sort of light bits as well yeah well you've seen the show so you know what it's like it's just a magazine version of the show but yeah you get that every two months so the next one's out in january so i don't know christmas present not used to advertising but anyway i know that there's lots of patrons watching thank you so much it's so exciting for me i can still do this even though lockdown is over mostly people are still coming to the show so thanks so much um obviously not everyone can afford to do that that's the point it's such a good business model because if you can't afford to like buy science lessons you can still come to these and you can come to my home ed lesson if you want i do on a tuesday at half past one um if you still would like to help you could like my facebook page that'd be cool i've got a competition going on with a friend of mine haven't told him but i'm looking at his page very carefully so thank you for your facebook likes or you could subscribe to my youtube channel that would be really cool as well you could come to my panto that i'm doing this is the last show before christmas because i'm doing a science panto on the 21st it's in my events section of facebook i think it's the uh i think it's 10 and 6 or something one in the morning and one in the evening it's, i think that's it thank you so much and share yeah if you could just tell everyone about this that would be super cool as well um right other than that Thank you so much for coming, everybody. Um, and I hope to see you again very soon. Yeah, just keep showing up. That's the nicest thing, isn't it? I just love reading your comments. And you are making me better at this, definitely. You can go on YouTube and see my first lessons. They were, they were you know, I'm, I'm practised now, that's what I'll say. <laughs> yes, it's time to read the comments. So bye-bye, everybody, who doesn't want to just hang around and watch me wittering on for a bit. Bethany, yeah, that is a fake poo next to my basil. Very good spot. We just reference poo so much in these lessons that I thought it was worth just having one as a visual aid. I have talked about poo, haven't I, a bit? I can't remember why. Anyway. Yeah, it's just there, just in case. <laughs> oh, bye, Phoenix and Vesper. I'm glad that you enjoyed that. Oh, bye, Finn. Oh, I'll see you Tuesday, Eli. Oh, Katie, thank you for saying that you love the magazine. That's really good. Bye, Bastion. Bye, Rowan. Tilly and Tia really enjoyed this. A little slice of home. Oh, that's nice, Tilly and Tia. So Christmas and fantastic science. That's good. That's a good review, isn't it? Bye, Hamish and Lottie. Oh, thanks, Sophie. Signing up to Patreon. Mm -hmm.